July 21st, 1861 is a beautiful day for the first major battle of the war. Union soldiers, their uniforms clean and pressed, march on Bull Run Creek under General McDowell. They are 37,000 strong. Martial music plays and Union banners flap in the wind. Waiting at Bull Run Creek are 22,000 Confederates commanded by General Beauregard and Sidney Johnston. Their strategy is to defeat the enemy's rear and endanger Washington, D.C. Both armies converge near Stone Bridge on Bull Run Creek. A small contingent of Northerners block the southern advance of the bridge. It is up to southern forces to break through this blockade and continue their assault against the enemy. We win this battle, boys. The war's ours for the taking. These northern boys turn and run. You'll see. Here they come. Let's move, men. Forward! Battle boys, the war's ours for the taking. These northern boys turn and run. You'll see. Here they come. Let's move, men. Forward!
Soldier, a cavalry charge will occur down the road, right through the Union Center. All three barricades must be blown to protect the charge. Here are your explosives. Good luck!
Go!
A Union victory looks assured when Confederate General Thomas Jackson is told, General, they're beating us back. He replies calmly, then we will give them the bayonet. His bold defense turns the tide of the battle and forever enshrines him in military lore as Stonewall Jackson. Along with Jeb Stuart, the counterattack pushes the Union forces back to Stonebridge where panic sets in. It turns into a full-blown rout for the Union. 5,000 Union soldiers never return home. Those that do stagger back to Washington, D.C., their clean uniforms now bloody and tattered. The Union is humiliated, and the event comes to be known as the Great Skedaddle. In Richmond, Confederate President Jefferson Davis rejoices and claims a great victory over the Union. But it's clear now to both sides that this war will not be short nor painless to either side. Spring of 1862, General McClellan refuses to fight with his enormous army of the Potomac, but General Ulysses S. Grant is anything but timid. He camps on the west side of the Tennessee River at Pittsburgh Landing. Across from him, Sidney Johnston masses his troops in Corinth and plans a surprise attack. Grant's large encampment, 42 kilometers in size, is not properly defended. In the early morning, Commanding an equal force of raw recruits, Confederate General Johnston knows he has to stop Grant now before reinforcements arrive. But before the battle is about to begin, a small group of soldiers is about to infiltrate the enemy's positions. Listen up, soldier. You will slip into the center of the Union camp, eliminating all obstacles as you go. That means slitting throats. You will steal into the general's tent and procure strategic documents. You click. You will then sabotage their survey balloon, and on your way out, destroy the enemy's ammo depot. You will avoid all lighted areas. A platoon of men should be doing this, but you're all I've got. Now don't let me down, son.
Listen up, soldier. Slip into the center of the Union camp, eliminating all obstacles as you go. That means slitting throats. You'll steal in the tunnels to take away the country.
Dave is going to oh. give you a medal for that, I guess. Now, let's get on out to the boats. Taking heavy losses, the Union finally retreats to the Tennessee River. They hold that position as a dozen massive assaults are launched and 62 cannons blaze away. Confident of a total Southern victory, General Beauregard is shocked to face 72,000 enemy soldiers the next morning, as Buell has arrived the night before with reinforcements. Grant takes the field and forces the South to withdraw after a murderous engagement. All in all, after two days of fighting, there are 23,000 casualties, more than in all previous American wars combined. The costly Union victory shakes the divided nation to its very core. The war is a calamity that will require more bloodshed and sacrifice than anyone could have ever imagined. For Grant, the victory only steals his determination. The way to the South is now open. In the late summer of 1862, General Lee invades the North, hoping to deliver a fatal blow to the Union. Lincoln sends General McClellan to stop Lee in his tracks at Sharpsburg, Maryland. Even though McClellan captures Lee's dispatches, exposing his entire battle plan, the overly cautious Northern General still will not act for two days. This gives Lee more and more confidence. The North achieves a temporary advantage at Bloody Lane, where Confederate soldiers are trapped in a sunken road and slaughtered. In the southern section of the battlefield, Burnside attacks the bridge at Antietam Creek.
They've crossed the bridge, men. We're gonna stop them before they reach our cannons. Anything that moves is fair game. We said our prayers, so let's go. They've crossed the bridge, men. We're gonna stop them before they reach our cannons. Anything that moves is fair game. We said our prayers, so let's go. They've crossed the bridge, men. We're gonna stop before they can
Eliminate those high-tailing federals! Protect him, soldier, at all costs!
Enemy cannot be allowed to cross that bridge, or they'll be out of range of our big guns.
Lee is overwhelmed at Antietam Creek and has no more reserves to bring up. It looks like his army will be destroyed when at the last minute General Ambrose Hill arrives with reinforcements and beats back the northern advance. The next day, Lee expects an all-out attack and certain destruction, but no attack comes. Once again, McClellan allows the great general to escape. He retreats back into Virginia, able to fight another day. The battle does not give either side a decisive victory, and yet 23,000 casualties occur, nine times the number that fell at Normandy. Tremendously disappointed, Lincoln still declares this a victory, and within days signs the Emancipation Proclamation. England decides against backing the South, an act that will affect the entire outcome of the war.